What? Do you remember last week? No? Love. Talked about love last week. Love's the first one, right? And then this week we're going to talk about joy. So today we're going to be taking a look at that. I am going to read that scripture again for us. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Remember, we talked about the fruit being singular, the fruit of the Spirit, but yet the, the next ones are all buds from that, or they're a part of that. So someone leaving the church one Sunday told the pastor, whatever you do, don't miss the joy. Wise words. Robert Louis Stevenson said near the end of his life, to miss the joy is to miss everyone, everything. To miss the joy is to miss everything. If we go through life without joy, we probably have had a pretty sad life and a difficult life, and yet we need to strive to have joy. And I don't think many would argue with that. As a church, we want to encourage people to experience the joy. Are we really supposed to experience that in our lives? All too often, joy is lacking in our lives. We, we get this thing... We, we kind of think that all of these fruit or these buds from the fruit of love are like these touchy-feely feelings that we have inside. You know, when we hear our society talk about love, it's kind of the touchy-feely love. Oh, I love you. And I have these feelings that bubble up inside of me. And, and yet what I find usually, people that say that, after a little while they find out that the person they love isn't as perfect as they thought they were, and now they don't really like them all that well. So love wasn't really just about uh, some deep commitment. It was just about a feeling that we had. Well, you know, there was a time that, that there were foods that I loved to eat, and now I don't really care for them all of that much. Did I really love them then, or did I just appreciate the fact that they tasted good at that time, and did I really love them? So I'm very cautious when I throw the word love around because I think in our society that we do that too much. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then we do something. And as a pastor, this is a confession for me as a pastor, I've had, through my 30 years of ministry, tell, people tell me all the time, Oh, pastor, I love you. You're a great pastor. And I make one mistake, and I'm not great anymore, and they leave the church. I'm like, man, you didn't love me very much, because I think we could, we could work through that, couldn't we? We could talk about that and figure that out, but... So we throw that around um, quite easily. So when it comes to joy, we have joy lacking in our life because a lot of times we think as long as things are going my way and I'm happy and things are kind of exciting, I have joy. But if things get hard and difficult, I don't have joy anymore. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm kind of bummed and I, I, I'm not feeling bubbly because, again, we're basing it on a feeling, how we feel. And yet, joy isn't necessarily always about just a feeling. All too often, joy is lacking in our lives. The keen observer of Christians once said, Christians seem to have a religion that makes them miserable. They are like people with a headache. They don't want to get rid of their heads, but it hurts them to keep it. Have you ever ran across Christians like that, though? I mean, it's kind of this, oh, i got to do this, i got to get up on Sunday mornings, i got to go to church, they want me to show up at Bible study, they want me to work in the kitchen, they want me to do this. <gasps> oh, I can't stand it. Oh, it's so much, and we're miserable. It's like, why, why do we feel that? And it's because we don't really have the joy that God would desire for us to have. Because it's more than just a physical joy. We Christ followers should have the most joyful often and often find that we often find ourselves lacking at the most. And I don't know about you, are, are, am I the only one that feels that sometimes? I mean, there are times, like this morning, when I kept getting calls and, and oh, I'm not going to make it today and I'm not going to make it today and, 
or last night at 10:30. And again, no, I understand. I'm not complaining about. But life happens. When that happens, sometimes it's hard to have joy and excitement. I was kind of dreading getting here this morning because, like, I got to run upstairs. I got to get all of this ready. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. And see, even in the midst of all of that, I still didn't even have my message up here. I had to leave and do that. So um, that kind of sucks our joy when we're depending on it as a feeling. But I'm happy to be here today. I'm honored to be able to stand before you and present God's Word. I'm excited that my daughter said yes last night and said, I'll come in. And when I looked at Bob and I said, hey, can you give up something with Darlene in the service today? Would you be willing to come up and do the live stream? He happily agreed to do that. And I, I appreciate that. So I'm joyful. It's not that I just get frustrated sometimes in that joy, but I'm always happy to serve the Lord. A Christian follower should have that joy, but we don't often, and we wonder why. And yet, when I read the, the Word of God, I read that Satan is the stealer of our joy. There's a song on the radio, um, Fear is a Liar. Fear sucks our joy. Satan wants to sap our joy. If he can have us come all um, prune-faced and, and struggling, sitting in the pews, you know, I, I can... I don't want to give away all my secrets, but I can pretty much tell when I'm up here preaching who's having a good day and who's having a bad day. I can just tell that. Your emotions show that. And, and again, we can't necessarily change that, but, but we, Satan wants to steal our joy. He wants coming to church to feel like drudgery. He wants serving God to feel like drudgery. He doesn't care if we're here. He doesn't care if we're here, just as long as we're not excited about it and we're not seeing Jesus move in a powerful way. He's, he's okay with that. Hey, come and hang out in church, but, but you know, in the middle of that, as long as you don't like love Jesus so much that you're willing to do stupid things for him or crazy things. Stupid probably wasn't. Aliana would tell me up there that Grandpa just said stupid. So, Aliana, I'm sorry. We do crazy things for Jesus sometimes. We should be able to, and yet there are times where we, we're, we, we just we want to be so proper, and we, wanna, we don't want somebody to look at us funny. You know, who, who's going to look at that person that gets excited during church and goes, Woo-hoo! And they're, they're looking, man, that, guy, that person's nuts. That guy's crazy. And yet Satan's like, yep, he is. Shame on you for being excited about Jesus. That's what he wants. So the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Jesus said, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. John 15, 5. You've heard it for the last three weeks now. If we remain in him, we will bear much fruit. If we are connected to Jesus, then joy should be evident in our lives. And each branch joined to Jesus, the life-giving vine, the fruit we bear will be joyful. When you really love somebody, is it drudgery to do something for them? No. I've had conversations the past couple of weeks with different people that was talking about people in their lives that they love so much and they would do anything for them with joy. And the scripture talks about joy all the way through. It says that we're to be joyful givers, that we're to be, to be joyful in the Lord, that we should be... Um, overflowing and gushing with the greatness of who he is last week we talked that again the fruit is not fruit it's a fruit which is produced in joy is love rejoicing joy is love rejoicing we're connected to jesus with the fruit of the spirit and as evidence of our relationship with him we should be joyful because the life of jesus and his spirit is in us you ever feel like you're alone sometimes you're just all alone and we kind of start to get depressed and frustrated and and scared and all of that because we're feeling alone there's an old hymn we used to say that said no never alone no never alone he doesn't forget us he he cares about us if we don't feel his presence 
it's either we're not seeking for it or we are so disappointed that he's carrying us. We've heard the, the poem Footprints in the Sand, right? Um, there have been times in my life where I knew the only way I was getting through was because Jesus had me in his arms and he was carrying me through. And I know that you have experienced that too. So even in the difficulty of our situation, we can still have joy knowing that our God loves us so much that even in the difficult times, he says he will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, that he'll be with us always, that we can know that. And we forget that, and when we forget that, we lose our joy. We lose it because we can't see past our situation. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence that we can be reconnected with God. Psalm 1611, You make a path of life known to me. Complete joy is in your presence. Pleasures are by your side forever. Jesus has put us into a path of life. Scripture says life abundantly even. Not just life, but he's put us in a path of having life abundantly. And a complete joy that is whole and lacking nothing is found only in God's presence. You can't find it anywhere else. You can't find it in a bottle. You can't find it in a pill bottle. You can't find it anywhere else than in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. One of the best ways to see the difference between human joy and the joy God gives us is found in John 15. We find here that Jesus is with the disciples. It's the night before Jesus would be crucified. Jesus knows in a short time that he will be in the garden and Judas will have betrayed him and walked away. He knew all of that. He's, we're we're going to celebrate communion in a little bit and and this is what's happening at that time. They're setting with Jesus. He's sharing communion with them. He's breaking and sharing the elements. And, and yet he still knows that the next day is going to be his last for a quick moment. A quick moment. He knew that Judas was going to betray him, that he was going to be falsely accused by the religious leaders. He knows he's going to be beaten. He knows he's going to be mocked and spit upon. He knows within, an hour, within hours his hands are going to have metal stakes driven through them. He's going to experience unbelievable pain and torture. And it's all about to begin, and Jesus knows it. With these events pressing upon him, I want, to hear, I want you to hear what he says in John 15, 11. He says, you will be filled with my joy. You will be filled with my joy. In other words, he's sitting there knowing all of this is going to happen, and yet he still has joy. I want you to, you're going to have my joy. It's going to be upon you. Yes, your joy will overflow. When's the last time you felt your joy overflowing? Are you trusting in Jesus? Are you seeking Him and drawing upon Him? Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before Him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning the shame. Many of us could talk about joy if we knew we were about to experience, or couldn't, or could we, if we knew we were going to experience a violent death. Human joy would not hold up under such pressure. Only spiritual joy and supernatural joy in the Lord can last in the face of death. What are your sources, sources of human joy? Paul is not here with us today, but I had both the privilege and the struggle of being with him through his last days and even through the process of leading up to that. Dave was an amazing, amazing Jesus follower. 
He loved the Lord with all his heart. He loved the church. He he was my biggest cheerleader. Like the biggest thing I've missed is my every day or other day call where he would just call and say, how you doing today, Pastor? How can I pray for you? Everything going okay? I know it gets rough sometimes. Daily, if not daily, every other day, I got that call from him. And, and he, he went through this process. He started losing weight and losing weight and losing weight. And finally, through a lot of doctor's appointments, they found cancer in the lining of his stomach. And, and he said to me, Ken, I'm not doing chemo. I know who I am in Jesus. And if he's going to take me, he's going to take me. And for the next many weeks, I would come to see him, and we would sit on the couch, and we would cry together. We would laugh together. He would share how privileged he felt to be serving Jesus and, and to be going to see him shortly. And, and um, I, he, he, he's just one of my heroes because he had that joy, even in the midst of turmoil, even in the midst of facing death, just like Jesus did. He did it with joy and with compassion and with... He, he, he would truly utter the words that for the joy set before him, he endured cancer so that he could spend his eternity with Jesus. And that's what God's asking from us. The dictionary defines joy, joy as an emotional or emotion of great happiness. You know what happiness is? That's happenings. So you're happy about your happenings. So when you hear the word happiness, happiness is a feeling that comes from our surroundings because we're happy of uh, our great surroundings. Something or someone that provides pleasure, a source of happiness. Joy is to make glad or happy. So what's our source? Number one, celebration. We like to do celebrations, right? We do birthday parties. We do anniversaries. Any reason for a party will produce joy and happiness. And, and the issue is you have the party and everybody's excited and everything's good and then everybody goes home and it just goes back to normal or you're frustrated because now you've got to clean up the mess of everybody's happiness and, and all of that. But we like to do that. Unexpected surprises like a, a raise in pay. I'm always happy when my boss gives me a raise I mean that that's something to be happy about isn't it and or how about the birth of a baby that's usually a happy time right you get all excited and and um, or even just an un, unexpected surprise coming in the devil is a counterfeit he wants to create a sense of joy in people and as we can join together in church and celebrate what God has done for us the devil again he has everything. When I drive by the bars sometimes, and I see car, there, there are more cars parked there than at the churches most of the time, just so you know. And it's not so much that they just want to drink. There's somewhat of an atmosphere there, an atmosphere of excitement. They, you know, you go down to Fallen Timbers here, you can do karaoke, you can get all crazy and do things that you wouldn't necessarily do and, and all of that. And, and there's a, 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 an excitement that gathers around things happening and things going on. And, and so we find people go there just to, because it's kind of just a big party gathering. And you wouldn't even necessarily have to have the booze to do it. It's just... People are excited to get together. The second is relationships. People experience joy through their relationships. Family reunion or a family gathering during holidays is a joyful occasion. Being together with friends to laugh and play can transform a heavy heart into a heart of joy. How about achievements? We have a sense of joy when we've accomplished something. I'm a goal-oriented person. I like to see things done. When I used to work with wood and lumber that's what sometimes frustrates me as a pastor because i i want to see things done and that might frustrate you guys sometimes because i i want to see things done i'm not one just to step back and just do nothing and have nothing happen so my woodworking and my construction background 
was to be able to take this piece of wood and turn it into something, to be able to, to take a, a pile of wood and, and begin to erect it and have a house stand up and, and all of that. I, I, adjo- I enjoyed accomplishing that kind of stuff. The struggle in the church sometimes is that even though you're accomplishing things, it never feels like you've accomplished everything. So I struggle with that sometimes, but we find joy in achievement, and that's why sometimes we get frustrated when things aren't happening as quickly. The church took a huge hit during COVID. We're still experiencing the ripples from that. And it didn't allow us to attain or achieve the goals that we had before us. We had to change everything. Everything changed. They told us we couldn't come in the church anymore. We had to then come up with live streams and everything else just to keep some kind of connection. And it's happened now that people are actually more comfortable. It, it was pretty comfortable for me sitting home in my jammies praising Jesus and, and um, getting up and having my cup of coffee. And, and yet, that's not what God intended for the church. It were to gather together in relationships and achievement. How about wealth, health and well-being? How many of us have had those times of just enjoying life and everything that we had? It may be a sunny day. We may be seeing a rainbow after a rain or enjoying the beauty of the world. How about helping others? We find deep sense of satisfaction when we can reach beyond ourselves to give someone assistance in their time of need. All of these human expressions of joy have one thing in common. Human joy is temporary. Human joy is temporary. That's why we have roller coasters of emotions, because we're riding the emotions instead of planting ourselves at the feet of Jesus. So that even in those roller coaster times, we know that he's on the roller coaster with us. The sense of joy and happiness is linked to the moment. It is tied to the circumstances which produce or bring about the joy. Isn't it any wonder that the word happy comes from the same root of happen? Happy and happen come from the same word hap, which means luck or chance. Can you see how happy or happen are related? Good luck brings happiness that which occurs by luck or chance or happening. Human joy passes away. It doesn't last. Just as the sand quickly runs through an hourglass, these are the days of our lives. And as the sand falls through your fingers, human joy comes to an end and is no more. Ecclesiastes 12.1 The days of trouble come, and the years catch up with you. They will make you say, I have found no pleasure in them. I've got good news. We don't have to be limited to just human expression of joy. Instead of a temporary joy, we can have a joy that lasts. So let's take a look at that. I don't even know what time it is. 1428, so I don't know where we're at. Isaiah 51:11. The ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Goodness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Everlasting joy can be ours. Have you ever experienced it? Everlasting joy? I I hope that you have. I pray that you have. Are we still striving for that? I know I'm a work in progress. I'm still striving for it. It's not always there for me. My humanness still comes in, and, and I struggle. We learn something very interesting here about joy. Gladness and joy are pursuing you. Joy is right behind you and ready to overtake you. You just have to let it. You have to let it. Just like the Holy Spirit lives within us, He's wanting to work and respond, but we have to let Him. We have to set Him free to do that, to be able to experience that. God gave an absolute promise to His people. Their faith could be sure and unmovable, for in the same way God had brought his children out of the bondage of Egypt. of Egypt, He would likewise set them free from exile in Babylon. Taken from their homes and displaced, they would have nothing of their own. 
but God would overtake them with everlasting joy. Sorrow and grief would be gone forever. But that promise is also for you and me. In this ever-changing world, the joy that we experience today is only a step away from sorrow. God doesn't want us to live a yo-yo roller coaster up and down life. He wants you to have everlasting joy independent of our circumstances. He wants us to have more than just happiness born of our happenings. He wants us to have joy to endure regardless of our circumstances. How can we receive everlasting joy? The supernatural, spiritual joy of the Lord. Isaiah tells us, Lasting joy will be given to the ransomed of the Lord. Those redeemed by God, those whom God has purchased, will be overtaken by gladness and joy. Sorrow and grief will melt away for those who belong to God. We are those who belong to God. If you have asked Christ into your life, if you're seeking him with everything that you are, we do belong to him. Romans 5, 10 and 11 says, For since we are restored to friendship with God by the death of his Son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. That's powerful. We're going to enjoy communion together in a little bit that I keep going back to. That's remembering the price that Jesus paid to set us free, to redeem us, to allow us to live a joy-filled life. We have been ransomed, but reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It has redeemed our lives and made us friends of God. Therefore, when we are connected to God through Jesus Christ, we can have his joy, the joy of the Lord, a supernatural joy that will not end. So what's the key? What's the key to that? What's the key to everlasting joy? It's to be intimate, in an intimate and loving relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't have joy in your life, then I have to ask this question. Are you connected to Jesus? Are you connected to the vine? Again, it's one thing to say I'm connected. It's another thing to be connected. Because if we're connected, then we don't have to say we're connected because our life is going to demonstrate that we're connected. So how do we stay connected? You've heard me say it over and over. We have to evaluate our lives on a daily basis. We have to make a spiritual plan. We need to make the effort to continually strive to grow closer to God. How do we do that? By sitting at the ballpark? By sitting out at the beach? Well, we can do it sitting at the beach if we've got our Bible and we're reading our Bible and we're praying and we're overlooking His beauty and we're building that relationship with him. Are you connected to him 24-7? One of the biggest reasons why there is no real difference between those who call themselves Christians and those who are not is compromise. If you're not sold out to Jesus, if you don't obey his word wholeheartedly, then everlasting joy will not be abundant in your life. Again, he is the vine. We are the branches. We have to stay connected to the vine if our branch is going to what? Produce fruit. What's the fruit? Love. What are the blossoms of that fruit? Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are all blossoms to that. Remember, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I am them will produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, if you lack the fruit of joy, it is not Jesus' fault. He is the life-giving vine. His life is in us and will produce joy.
So what's that tell us then? Is the problem with God? Or is the problem with me? The problem's with me. Psalm 66, 18, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Don't let sin rule your heart. Turn away from sin. Change your way of thinking. Doesn't say change your habits. It says change your way of thinking. If we change our way of thinking, then what happens to our habits? They change as well. We always look at it the other way. If I quit doing this, 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 this. I was witnessing to a guy a few years back and trying to invite him to church, and he said, I can't come to church. I'm like, why not? I'm not perfect. I'm like, guess what? I'm the pastor, and I'm not either. That don't mean that you don't come to church because you're not perfect. I had another one that <clears throat> uh, the spouse wouldn't let the husband come to church because he'd spend Saturday night drinking, and he was still hung over. She's like, you can't be a hypocrite and go into church on Sunday morning. I looked at her and said, there's no better place for him than to be in church on Sunday morning. I don't care if he's hung over or not. Don't tell him not to come to church. God will take care of the rest of it. We just have to change our thinking. It has to happen up here. That's why we're miserable as Christians, because we live it thinking that we've got this list of rules that we have to follow. It has nothing to do with the list of rules. It has everything to do with submitting ourselves to the power of a great God, changing our thinking, and let Him do the changing. He starts to take it away from you. I shared last week uh, my anger and everything that I had as a teenager growing up. I didn't just stop one day and say, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm going to quit doing that now. Guess what? After I was a Christian, there was a few times I still put my hand through drywall. When our kids were young, there were times where they would upset me so much, I would just put my hand into the wall. I mean, I, I, I was not perfect. I'm still not perfect. But he's taken that away from me. Are there times where it still creeps in? I've talked about that. When a driver pulls out in front of me or something like that, it starts to creep back in. And either my wife will say, Ken, we're not in a hurry, so it's all right. Or I actually, the Holy Spirit just is kind of like, hey, what difference does it make? So you're going to be 30 seconds later than you were before. Are you in such a hurry that 30 seconds is going to make a difference? We need to be attached to the vine. Permanently attached to the vine. Scripture is very clear. If we're not attached to the vine, what happens? The, the, the vine dresser comes along, cuts off the, the dry branches, and does what? Throws them into the fire. Doesn't give them another chance. Doesn't say, hey, maybe if we give you a whole bunch more water, maybe you can be attached again. That don't happen. So what do we do? I'm going to share with you some sap suckers. Sap suckers. Number one sap sucker is unconfessed sin. Psalm 66, 18. If you would cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But let sin rule. Don't let sin rule. Take away from, turn away from sin. Change your way of thinking. Second Chronicles 6.26 If the skies were shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you and then they prayed toward this temple and confessed your name and turned from their sins because of their punishment then hear from heaven and forgive their sins of their servants and of your people Israel. Teach them to do what is right and sent rain on your land that you have given to your people as their special, as your special possession. See, sin cuts us off from God's blessing. We've talked about this before. If we have cut, unconfessed sin in our life, it, it's a barrier to God doesn't mean he doesn't love us it doesn't mean he's turning our back his back on us that some would say it's a barrier we talked about that a few months ago in a message where you know continued sin that's unconfessed is just something that comes between us and God it's like our relationships if we've wronged somebody 
and we don't correct it, then there's a barrier there. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't like the person or anything else. There's just a barrier there, and that barrier has to be removed. And for us and God, it's confessing our sin. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It, it makes a clear way. It, it cuts us off from him. Don't let sin suck the life of Christ out of you. Sap sucker number two, broken relationships, Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. This is how I want you to conduct yourself in these matters. If you enter your place of worship, about to make your offering, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you. Not that you have against them, but you remember one that they have against you. Leave immediately, but it would work both ways. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then, come back and work things out with God. If we're not right with other people, we can't be right with God. It stands in the way. Sap sucker number three, a wounded ego, pride. You ever have your pride wounded? I've had mine wounded many times. I don't like it. It doesn't fit me well. I don't care for it. Proverbs 29, 23, it's on the message. Pride lands you flat on your face. Humility prepares you for honors. Um, Proverbs 6, 16 and 17. Here are six things that... Six things God hates, and one more than that he loathes with a passion. Eyes that are arrogant. It's one he loathes with a passion. Eyes that are arrogant. Psalm 32, 5, Then I left it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast for, the, for my failures to God. Suddenly the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. I've talked with you about the unforgiveness I held toward another pastor for almost a year. And it was when I finally faced that and did what I could to mend that relationship that I was set free. There was like a, a weight was taken off of my shoulders, just like it says here. Um, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. Suddenly the pressure is gone. Sap sucker number five, unpleasant circumstances. James 1, and two, James 1, 2 and four, two, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Psalm 126, 2 and 3 and 5 and 6. Our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. It's vital for us in our spiritual journey to produce the fruit of joy. Who would want what we have if all it is is drudgery and pain? None of us would. How much life do we receive sometimes out of people around us that are joyful and excited about life? It, it, it's like catching. It, it, it's, I can't even come up with the word, I guess. It's just infectious, that joy. Same is true with those that are prunes. I'll just say it politely. You, you know, a prune face. Or, you know, who, who wants to hang around a prune? Does anybody even like prunes? Do you like, some of you like prunes? Well, God bless you. 
God bless you. I'm glad someone can eat that stuff because I just kind of meh to me. So we need prunes. We need prunes to wake us up sometimes, I guess. Make things work better. But should we have joy? Should we strive for joy? I pray that you do. This life is hard. I know it is. There are curves thrown at you from every way. But we really choose how we're going to respond to that. And it's really easy to just kind of get caught up with it and get discouraged and disappointed and frustrated. But all that happens when we end up that way is everybody we come in contact with, we pull them that way too. So let's have joy and pull people that way. When we as a church can come together filled with excitement and joy and can't wait to stand up and sing about Jesus and, and all of that kind of stuff, that people are going to want what we have. That's what brings people into churches. People that they know that have joy. Not the ones that we mentioned here that think that Christians have headaches and they'd like to remove their head, but they can't. Let's not be that. Let's be something different. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your great love for us. What a privilege it is to serve you. What a joy it is to be called your children. What an honor it is to know that you gave your life that we might have life. There's so many things this is, that this world throws at us. There's so many things that sin causes in this world. Even our health issues at times are direct causes of other people's sin and yet the wage of sin is death but we do have the gift of God that is eternal life so Lord may we be filled with joy in that life that you have for us we love you, we give you praise we honor you for it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray Amen so we're going to spend a little bit of time in communion.